This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you're starting a blog, a store, or need marketing tools, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Okay, do we go with the champions to start? Maybe it's back. I don't know, they'll, they'll be expecting those. I know. It's champion time. Hello, I'm Adrian and welcome to Ramona TV back in the studio. No more garden videos, sorry fellas, but I welcome you. Thank you for joining me for this Champions League preview and predictions. Your presence is appreciated as we go through all eight groups, all 32 teams, and of course we predict where everyone will finish correctly. And remember, I'm never wrong. So let's get into Group A. We'll have a quick break to check in on www.benficaisabsolutelymassive.club, thanks to our sponsors, and then we'll continue through the groups. What a group to start out. Napoli and Liverpool are once again with each other. And Ajax, another familiar foe from 2020 for Liverpool. And Rangers, back in the Champions League for the first time since 2010, actually. Let's start with Liverpool, who look as though this season will be a bit of a transitional period for them, given some of the losses within their squad. But with the players they still boast, there's always a possibility of winning things should they stay healthy, which has been the toughest part of their season thus far. Not even a full month has gone by and Liverpool already have an injury crisis, with their midfield looking especially thin. Clearly their attack is doing alright, and while Darwin showed a major, major red flag with his immaturity and letting himself get rattled by Anderson against Crystal Palace, he will still score goals for them. A major adjustment to Premier League football was always expected and has always been what I said as far as expectations go with Darwin, but he will be important for them eventually. Last season, he killed it in the Champions League and with further settling in, he could repeat that feat and I think he will. But Napoli will be a terribly difficult side for Liverpool to contend with as they are in their second season under massively underrated Italian manager Luciano Spalletti, who has the team playing incredibly well. They too have had to deal with massive losses, Koulibaly, Mertens and Insigne lost in one window is obvious what they bring on the pitch, but they will be missed in the dressing room as well. Those are bona fide leaders. Thankfully for them, they have brought in some fantastic players, such as the Georgian wonder kid Kovara, who is impressed with how direct he is and his skill in the finish. He will be a nightmare for right backs all season long. On top of that, Min Jae Kim has looked fantastic at center back. Raspadori arrives to back up the attack. It could be better. Giovanni Simeone is a proven scorer. Napoli are building a great team. What I mean by Raspadori is he hasn't started great, but he's young and he will grow with the team. Ajax have suffered. Suffered massive losses this summer. Haller to Dortmund, Gravenbrook and Masraoui to Bayern, Talia Fico to Lyon, Martinez and Antony left for Man United alongside their manager Eric Ten Hag. I mean, Ten Hag's replacement, Alfred Schroeder, did win the Belgian Championship with Brugge last season, and things have looked good under him thus far in the Eredivisie. But you can't help but feel they have been rocked a bit by departures, even if they have made some big signings like Bergwijn and Bassi, who replaces Martinez. And Rangers, I mean, welcome back. Nice to have not one, but two Scottish sides in the Champions League for the first time since 2008. They had a fantastic run under Van Bronckhorst, who replaced Steven Gerrard and led them to second, plus a Europa League final. A great performance from them and some great performances in their qualification run to the Champions League group stage. They turned around a 2-0 first leg deficit to eliminate Belgian surprise side Union saint gilloise while also winning 1-0 away to PSV, which was very important for their qualification. They've also been great domestically, and I expect them to really push every single side in this group. In fact, I have them finishing in third after just edging Ajax in the dogfight for Europa League. I have Napoli finishing in first and Liverpool in second. I know, Adrian, Ajax in fourth. That's shocking. And I realize that these predictions may be a bit shocking for you guys. And I actually have more shocks for you. Thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Our stunning website, Benfica is absolutely massive.club. The journalistic monolith has more blog posts for you to enjoy. So take it away, Adrian, the unpaid intern. Hi everyone, yes, we do have some exciting new articles on our fantastic new website, www.benficaisabsolutelymassive.club, but first, thank you to all who have commented, except for those leaving comments about paying unpaid intern Adrian. I have been told to tell you to stop doing that. And also, to Porto is bigger than Benfica, you're making my propaganda life difficult, but also prove it. I don't see a beautiful website that says so. If you want to try for yourself, you could always use 
our discount code, but more on how you can get a great deal on building a website with Squarespace in a moment. Because there's a new section on our website that utilizes one of Squarespace's many features. Yes, you can now stay in the know on all of Benfica's biggest dates and events thanks to Squarespace's events function, which we have used to perfection. As you can see here, we have a massive event set for June 10th, 2023. What could that be? Be sure to head to www.benficaisabsolutelymassive.club in order to find out for yourself. On top of that, you guys have been leaving so many lovely comments on our blog posts. We appreciate it. And we have a very special Champions League theme post thanks to Squarespace's incredibly easy to use blog functions. In fact, Squarespace is the best all-in-one platform to build your own stunning website, just like Benfica is absolutely massive.club, making it easy to build a store, build a portfolio to expand your online presence, get access to marketing and SEO tools, create members only sections for your top supporters, analytics, connect all of your socials easily and so much more. I created these events and blog posts in about 10 minutes, so imagine what an actually talented person like you could do with Squarespace. So guys, head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your own incredible site, go to squarespace.com slash TV to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I mean, the domain options are endless. I mean, just look at our URL, it's crazy. But thanks, Squarespace. Back to Adrian. And back to standing normally for me. Group B sees Portuguese champions FC Porto contend with Atletico, Leverkusen, and Belgian champions Club Brugge. Club Brugge lost a young starlet in Charles de Catalara, but they have not one but two Canadians on their team, so they are winning the group by default. I jest, of course. No matter how strong Buchanan and Laren make them, I don't see Brugge making it out of this group. I would love to see it, of course, and I hope they surprise me for obvious reasons. And of course, I have a ton of love for Roman Yeremchuk, who recently signed for them. But yeah, the teams ahead of them will have far too much. One of those teams being Bayer Leverkusen, who looked incredible last season, but have been truly awful to start the season, haven't they? They at least finally got a competitive victory after getting dumped out of the Pokal by a team they had absolutely no business losing to, then losing their first three Bundesliga matches. A terrible start, but they made up for that kind of with their 3-0 slap up of minds, four consecutive losses snapped by a victory finally. They've signed both Callum Hudson-Odoi and Adam Hlozek, great young players, but is that enough to fire them into the knockout rounds? Atletico Madrid, on the other hand, are a bit of a quandary as well. Always look so good on paper, but the results are bizarre. That said, I do like some of the changes they have made recently. Losing Lodi was a disappointment for them, I'm sure, but I am part of the church of Reguilon, so I love that signing for them, and what he can bring down that left flank must excite Colchineros. Morata returns for now as the Saul, while Witzel boosts their midfield options. Again, as always, on paper, I enjoy Atletico Madrid. Their squad is fantastic, in my opinion, and capable of massive achievements when all is firing and everyone is playing to their strengths. But we just don't see that enough these days, do we? And Porto, I've watched them long enough to not sleep on them. Porto fans always get sensitive with me when I think a top European side will beat them, failing to notice the strengths that I always point out when talking about them and only focusing on the negative. Come on, guys, be more positive. But anyway, they had a surprising result this past week, consistently strong side, and that 3-1 loss to Rio Ave was a bit of a red herring. They dominated everything but the scoreline and suffered from grave errors at the back. Conceição always organizes his teams incredibly well, and they are bastards to play against, while simultaneously boasting strikers that can win penalties, like Taremi. <laughs> Don't worry guys, I'm joking. I know he does more than just that. We're just joking around here. Gabriel Veron could be an incredible signing once he settles in. Even Nielsen looks good. The midfield has solid options as well. And so the final rankings I see are a dogfight for first and second between Atleti and Porto, of which Atleti edges it, but just barely. Then Leverkusen in third, ahead of Brugge. And here we are with the annual Bayern versus Barcelona Champions League tradition. <laughs> it was groundhog day for them as they were drawn in the same group for the second consecutive year, but have faced each other in the knockout rounds as well. That fateful day back in Lisbon. Anyway, Barcelona are a completely different side, boasting a completely familiar figure to Bayern and Robert Lewandowski. He's had a great start to his Barcelona career, scoring goals at a similar rate to how he did at Bayern, scoring back heels. 
I mean, commonplace stuff for the Polish striker. He could do it in the Bundesliga, he could do it in La Liga, because he is quality. Barcelona in general have backed Xavi like few clubs have backed their managers this season, with the only question marks for me being in the fullback positions, but even then, it's not a mortal wound by any means. Xavi's midfield, center back positions, and attack look great, and should they continue to thrive on this trajectory, they will be an incredibly difficult team to play against for any top side in Europe. I mean, Ansu Fati returning? It's crazy. Bayern, on the other hand, have continued to look stunning with their new look attack. Like I said in the Bundesliga preview and on my podcast, Unsackable, available on all streaming platforms, by the way, I wondered if Bayern would resemble Nagelsmann's vision for their attack more so without a focal point like Lewandowski up there. So far, so good as they have scored for fun despite being held by Gladbach this past weekend, and they've also improved both in the midfield and in defense. Bayern are always a scary side. They haven't lost a group stage match in 28 attempts, and I have them finishing top. Oops, spoiler alert. Victoria Plzenia. Hey man, I'm sure they saw this draw and emulated the reaction from their Czech compatriots a few years ago. That's a yikes moment for them. However, they have ground out the results in qualifying, going through HJK, Sheriff Tiraspol, and Kerabeg. They've run through three rounds of qualifying just to be placed in a group with Inter, Barca, and Bayern. That's unfortunate. I mean, competitively, it's not a great situation for them, but as far as experience goes for the players, they couldn't have asked for anything more as they get to go to the Allianz Arena, Spotify Camp Nou, and the San Siro. Inter have added well to their squad, most notably giving Lotaro the partner he missed and the partner he deserves in Lukaku. He will, however, likely be out for a few weeks in September. It could be the entirety of the month, which means Inzaghi will have to look to either Correa or Dzeko once again in the attack. I like what I've seen thus far from Inter. With Bayern in first and Victoria in fourth, I see Inter and Barca fighting for second, in which I have Barca finishing just ahead of Inter, who will go on to win the Europa League probably. I mean, if I'm right in them finishing third, of course. Group D is a very, very competitive group lucky sporting, in which you could roll the dice and place any of the teams from second through fourth in any position or order, really. Let's start with the obvious, however. Tottenham under Antonio Conte are becoming a very different side from the ones we've been accustomed to seeing since Pochettino's prime years with Spurs. Conte's teams always cause problems, and with gifted attackers, they'll be able to hurt any of the teams they've been drawn against in this group. I see Marseille as causing them the most issues. The defense with Romero made a permanent signing recently, has improved quite a bit, but perhaps not as much as Conte would have hoped. That said, they are still undefeated and I expect them to win this group. Marseille have a new manager in Igor Tudor and so far so good under their new manager as he has them flying in Liga at the moment. Igor Tudor, man, he made Hellas Verona a headache with limited means and with Marseille and the talent at his disposal, they are going to be tough to deal with. Nuno Tavares is thriving as a left wing back. Vertu, Alexis Sanchez and Suarez arrive as great reinforcements. All the while, they haven't really lost anyone important. Marseille will be a very tough side. Sporting, they have been on a bit of a decline since winning the league a couple of seasons ago, but under Amarim, they cannot be slept on completely. They've had a poor start domestically, putting them in 13th with just one win from four matches, and they've lost two massive pieces of their midfield, Mateusz Nunez to Wolves and Palinha to Fulham. Their market hasn't been bad necessarily, as Trincaung has a lot to prove and this could provide a great platform for him. Questions defensively are what holds me back with Sporting, as I think their attack will eventually gel and start banging them in, but that defense, I mean, Anasio isn't at the level I thought he would be at at this point. And Eintracht Frankfurt, my oh my, what a strange team. They tend to finish mid-table in Germany and then, you know, manage to win some sort of cup. They may do so once again this season, but that cup won't be the Champions League, I don't think. I'm not going to put my money on it. I think the Pokal and a drop to Europa could be the best they could hope for as Oliver Glasner's side were handed an even group, but a difficult proposition once again for them. So, for my final predictions for this one, I have Spurs and Marseille finishing one and two, with Sporting in third, and Frankfurt vibing out in fourth. Group E sees Dinamo Zagreb return to the Champions League alongside Salzburg, Chelsea, and AC Milan. Dinamo Zagreb, as mentioned, have returned to the competition for the first time since, well, it hasn't been that long. The first time since the 2019-20 season, they had to run the gauntlet to get in here again, slipping past Skupi, Ludogorets, Razgrad, and Bodo Glimt. The 
Roma killers. And for their troubles, they're put into a very difficult group where manager Ante Kashik will be hoping to cause some surprises along the way. But that will be difficult. Once again, Mislav Orsic will be a handful for opponents. But beyond that, Petr Bokai will provide a threat through his vision. RB Salzburg are always a fun team to watch, but they are also a team that is consistently picked apart summer after summer, losing integral talents. But through their elite development program and scouting, they always seem to find someone to break through the ranks and become the latest sought after talent or the next RB Leipzig signing. <laughs> anyway, after losing Aronson and Christensen to Leeds, as well as Adeyemi to Borussia Dortmund and Kamara to Monaco, manager Matthias Jaisel has it against him once again, as his sides sit in second for the moment in Austria, a placement that high in his Champions League group would be nothing short of miraculous, I think. And I say that because they will be contending against the Italian champions AC Milan and Chelsea, a team that is weird as hell, but still a massive threat, of course. Chelsea, that is. Look, Chelsea supporters got upset at me for having them in fifth place this season in the Premier League, but I just cannot trust this side. I cannot trust Thomas Tuchel to get the attack settled, especially when he has misfiring players like Havertz and Sterling out there to lean on. And their defense is not the monolith that it used to be. However, to sleep on Chelsea and say they won't make it out of this group would be a massive mistake. They have a better overall squad than perhaps all of the teams within this group, and failing to get out of it would be a it would be a sack-worthy moment for Tuchel. And I only say that assuming they continue to flounder in the Premier League, where they have two wins from five attempts, just edging the potential relegation fodder that are Leicester and Everton. Maybe less so Leicester, but they're looking pretty grim themselves at the moment. AC Milan, they have made some nice additions this summer, such as Origi, De Catalara, Tiao, amongst others, while retaining important players that helped lead them to the Scudetto last season. One of the most important pieces of the squad, however, is the man organizing it all, Stefano Pioli, who of course has a few lieutenants in the squad, and Giroud, Zlatan, Kier, to combine all of the youthful exuberance and skill with the mature heads. Like I said in the Serie A preview, AC Milan's success was never down to having the best overall squad. But thanks to Pioli, their scouting and recruitment team, and the aforementioned experience in the squad. Should they find their form once again, I can see Milan finishing ahead of Chelsea in first, second for Blues, Salzburg dropping to Europa, and Zagreb just vibing. Okay, so the defending champions Real Madrid will be joined by Celtic, Shakhtar, and RB Leipzig in Group F. And let's get Real out of the way first. They will finish top in this group. <laughs> they have the same team as last season, with the only notable loss being Casemiro, of course, which is a big loss, to be fair. But Shuamani and Kamavinga will develop into world beaters. The only question is what happens in the present, of which I think they're both ready in the here and now. That's the only real question mark I have surrounding this Real Madrid side, especially in this context where they absolutely should finish above the rest of the teams in this group. Benzema still looks great, Vinicius as well. The one worry I have is once again, it, regarding the attack, if Benzema gets injured, what's the plan? Hazard through the middle? I'm not into it really, but I'll happily be proven wrong should it come to that. RB Leipzig looked so good under Tedesco last season, following him taking over for Jesse Marsh, firing up the standings and winning the Pokal. But this season, it's been a bit mixed, hasn't it? Not in the Pokal, where they beat Teutonia 05 Ottensen 8 0 with a hat trick from Werner, but they only got their first victory from four attempts in the Bundesliga this past weekend. Like Leverkusen, there's nothing to panic about, and the addition of Werner to their attack could propel them forward. The loss of Nordi Mukieli in defense, coupled with the losses of Konate and Upamecano from past seasons, does provide some question marks on their defensive ability, but they seem to be in good hands with Willy Orban, Simakas, and Halstenberg, should Halstenberg return from injury quickly. Keeping Limer and Campbell was massive for their midfield, as well as Nkunku, who continues to impress me in the attack. Shakhtar have lost quite a few players given all that has happened in Ukraine. As the Brazilian exodus from Ukraine has been real, Dodo, Marcos Antonio, Fernando, Ismaili, amongst others, have all left David Neres, leaving plenty of question marks as to how they will fare. They're no longer Samba East. They are far more Ukrainian than you'll have remembered them. And Celtic, well, 
what a team they have built for Postecoglou and just how the Australian manager has got them playing is remarkable, dipping into both the Japanese and Portuguese markets to build their side. Beyond that, Jota looks like a world beater at Celtic after leaving Benfica. He's been in incredible form for them and he looks so happy there. They are perfect thus far in Scotland, scoring 21 goals from just five matches and they too are part of the 9-0 club to start this season off. I think that Celtic is going to surprise many with how good they are, but I don't know if I can back them ahead of RB Leipzig. That team is just too good at the moment, and I think they will edge Celtic for second. Shout out Shakhtar, also part of the fourth place Vibes Club, in my opinion. Speaking of the Vibes Club, will Sevilla or Copenhagen? As they will have to contend with Man City and Borussia Dortmund here in Group G, that is not easy. So. Manchester City are fantastic. As Erling Haaland is making a mockery of the Premier League now with nine goals from five matches and two consecutive hat tricks. I guess the Bundesliga wasn't that bad, eh? All of you Farmers League people need to just sit down. He's making the English defenses look just as bad as the German ones. Just as Lewandowski is scoring for fun in La Liga thus far. Sometimes players are just really, really good. It's not always an indictment on the league that they're scoring. <laughs> anyway. He's been ridiculous. Julian Alvarez looks great as well. So City's attack is relatively sorted, but there are questions about their defense and midfield should injuries hit as Pep famously likes having a pretty small squad to work with. Sometimes you get burned by it. The center back positions in particular is one to watch as time goes on, but it is rare that all of them are fit at the same time. Regardless, they're finishing in first. I don't think there are many who would argue otherwise given the teams they are up against. No disrespect, of course. Sevilla have been stripped apart, most notably losing their starting center back pairing in Kunde and Diego Carlos, and bringing in Marcão from Galatasaray and Tangi Nyanzu from Bayern. We'll see how or if they gel. They have brought in some interesting attackers, including Isco and Yanuzai, but I get some very bad vibes from the Sevilla side. I love me some Isco, of course, and I wish him well, but I feel like, similarly to how I feel about them in Spain, they'll struggle in this group. FC Kobanavin have qualified with great merit as they defeated Turkish champions Trabzonspor on their way to the group stage draw, and they took Trabzonspor's striker Andreas Cornelius as well. They've had a strange start to their season as they sit in 8th place after 7 matches, unexpected, but I have them in 4th for this one, which is uh, probably totally expected. Borussia Dortmund, such a good window when you look at it on paper, and yet injuries had threatened their start to the season. Great to see one of those signings, Aler making public appearances again after receiving chemotherapy for his testicular cancer. Nicolas Sula was injured to start the season, but made his return to action this past weekend, while Nico Schlotterbeck has schlotted into that back line brilliantly. Adiemi, baller, once he settles, he'll be a pain in the ass, while Oshkan has added some protection to that back line from midfield, which they desperately needed. I like what Borussia Dortmund have done in the market. I like Terzic returning, and I hope that he can deliver with them as he did in his half season with the club when he had minimal pressure on him. There's a lot more of it now, that's for sure. I have Dortmund going through in second behind Manchester City, ahead of Sevilla, who will get Europa League and be happy about that. And Copenhagen, Copenhagen are part of the Vibes Club in fourth. Congrats. And finally, we have Group H, where PSG, Juve, Maccabi Haifa, and Benfica will be battling for first in the last group. Well, to paint it more accurately, Benfica, Juve, and Maccabi Haifa will be battling for second in the last group. Well, to check myself one more time, Maccabi Haifa will likely finish in fourth in the last group, though they deserve respect for how they played in qualifying. They had to go through Olympiakos, who they steamrolled. Apollon Limassol, who they edged out. Red Star as well, not the easiest run. They deserve to be here and could cause an upset in a match or two, but I don't see things going much further than that. PSG, I love what I'm seeing from Galtier and PSG. I think they will be one of the top contenders to win it all this season. Of course, when the going gets tough in the knockout rounds, that's when you see the true making of PSG. But if there was a manager that could potentially change the mentality of the players for the better, it's Galtier, one of two managers who was able to knock PSG off their perch since they started running up the league. Neymar looks very, very sharp, 
so far this season as he gears up for the World Cup. Messi has been brilliant, Mbappe has been finding his footing of late, and their midfield of Vitinha and Verratti has been really fun to watch. Galtier finding a proper shape for their attack is massive as well, with Neymar and Messi playing off of the left and right of Mbappe, respectively, in what becomes a 3-4-2-1 most of the time. I see nobody stopping them from getting that top spot, to be honest with you. Benfica has been a joy to watch this season, by the way. They scored 1 million goals in qualifying. Where previously I have wanted to claw my own eyes out watching Benfica, well, at least watching anything that came after the 2018-19 season, Benfica are playing very, very fluid attacking football under Roger Schmidt. Thank God. I've wanted a forward manager for a while now, and so I'm glad Schmidt has been brought in. Benfica have pressed well, they have a dynamic attack with David Neres finally providing a threat down that right flank. Schmidt's unlocked Juan Mario again. Florentino is thriving in the midfield alongside the incredible Enzo Fernandez. Ignore Fernandez, by the way, he's not good at all. Don't pay any attention to him. Injuries in defense could bring us down, as could errors defensively and namely in goal, but I have no problems with Benfica going forward. We're looking great in the attack and in the midfield. Juve have had a wild Mercato, bringing in a whole host of new faces for Maxi Allegri to try to get the most out of. When it comes to Juve, the defending is never really the issue, even if their fullbacks look a bit whack in my opinion. It's the threat going forward under Allegri that just doesn't do it for me. They have really failed to impress in Serie A so far, despite having a solid record of two wins and two draws at the time of recording this. Vlaovic has looked like the only glimmer of hope going forward for Juve. Di Maria could be added to that list as well, while Kostic will take some time to gel into this Juve attack. I don't love Juve's midfield that much. I think that if Paul Pogba is in there, it looks much better, of course. And Paredes will bring some quality when he isn't getting himself sent off or distracted slash drawn into stupid fouls. But they just haven't impressed me that much, and I put that on Allegri. As I said when I went on Gigi's Juve's channel and Pepe asked me about Allegri at Juve, my opinion was that he was a good person to bring in last season to bring some stability to the club to right the ship, but he won't elevate them to what they are capable of. You can bring in great attackers for Allegri, but that won't make them an attacking side. I think it will be hard to break down Juve for the most part, but there's absolutely room for Benfica to get at them. Misfiring in the attack may hurt Juve, and so I'm doing it again, just as I did last season when Benfica were considered third or fourth best in their group. I have Benfica going through ahead of Juve in second, Juve down to the Europa League, Kabi are part of Vibes FC. Will I be two times lucky with that Benfica call? We'll see, but I actually believe in this team to pull it off. And that will do it, guys. All of my picks for the Champions League, and I'm excited to hear yours. If you enjoyed this video, then hit that like or subscribe if you're new around here. Beyond that, I'm Adrian, and thanks for watching. Ciao.